Hi everyone. You know, um, I listened to the last few speakers, they were pretty good. Um, I didn't expect them to expand the room for me. <laughs> um, but it's good to see that many people interested in tax. <laughs> Fantastic. So I just want to go through, there's probably going to be three stages of this presentation. The first is I just want to go through some common questions that I get from people. Um, the second, I just want to go through some concepts when it comes to taxes and opportunities and identifying them. And the third is I'm going to go through some examples. So to start with, the common questions I get from people, usually someone has um, got some Bitcoin, they haven't told anybody about it, they don't want anyone to know about it, including me. Um, they come and approach me and say, hypothetically, I have a friend who has some Bitcoin. <laughs> they don't want anyone to know about it. Um, but for some reason, they need to convert it to fiat to buy something or whatever. Will the tax office find out? And if they do, is there a way I can do it without paying much tax? So that's the first question. The second one I get is from people who get really excited when Bitcoin goes up and buys high and sells low. And then they say to me, can I claim this against my taxes somehow because I've done my ass? My wife is going to kick me out of the house. <laughs> I need to get my money back. And the third and more uncommon one is, can I buy Bitcoin in my super? The answer to all of those questions is actually yes. Um, I, I say to people, you know, why does Warren Buffett uh, pay less tax than his secretary? It's because he knows what he's doing. One of the reasons people do approach me is because I do a lot of tax audits as well as tax compliance and planning. Um, and so people ask me, what's the tax office going to do? I just want to briefly go through that because that's important. So the way the tax system works is it's guilty unless proven innocent. So if you have a lot of Bitcoin and you want to convert it to fiat, the tax office doesn't need to know how much coin you have, they don't care. All they need is they see money go into your bank account or a bank account and they ask you where it's from. And if you say a story that doesn't make much sense, they're going to say, well, you need to pay a tax on it. And if they think you have more money, sorry. sorry. Quick question on that. Yep. Yep. It could be. They can. I'll go into that because that's, that's a, a little bit later on. But um, they, they, they'll just do a guess. And what they usually tend to do, because the system is guilty unless proven innocent, they just give you a really big bill. You know, it could be millions of dollars. It could be 10 million. You know, I had a client who ran some supermarkets. He got a $15 million bill. I said, to get a bill that size, he has to have $35 million in cash in his house. They said he might. He might have gambled it. So they then ask you to prove um, how much money you've got. So then you are the one who has to provide records, otherwise you get hit with this massive bill. So that's, that, that, that's a bit of, of background in terms of how they, how they think about it when all of a sudden this money comes into your bank account, which they do see. And they see that you bought a car, they look at your assets, they look at your house, and they say, well, this person has to have got this wealth from somewhere, and they have heaps of different ways of working it out. So what you want to do in that situation is work out some kind of technical basis for receiving the funds which doesn't generate any tax. And that goes to, my, to, the, to the next part, which I do have to explain a little bit of my background, because otherwise none of this will make sense. So I started my career working for a lot of investment banks and um, private equity and so on, and they used to do something called structured finance. Basically, I, I feel like I probably wasted a lot of my life on that until I reached this point with Bitcoin, which I think maybe it's connected the dots somehow and it might actually worth, prove worthwhile. But basically, what banks do is they transact with each other and there's no real transaction that actually happens. All that happens is they both pay less tax and then they share the tax spoils with each other. So a very common transaction which used to happen, for example, 
is if you have two banks in two different countries. In one country, they say, okay, I'm gonna lend you some money, right? So if I lend money to someone and I say I pay them interest, here I'll claim my interest as an expense, reduces the tax. Over there they pay tax on the interest and they pay tax there. But sometimes you have transactions where over here, maybe you can claim the expense for the interest, but over there you don't pay tax on the interest. So you end up just paying less tax. The transaction actually does nothing. And then what they do is they work out some pricing with each other where they share the benefits of that with each other. So it looks like a normal loan. The tax office looks at it, they say, wow, you just lent money to this other bank. Didn't really need it, didn't use it for anything, but you know, it looks legit. And so it, it sort of works. Now that kind of stuff did get shut down. Airlines used to do this a lot with aircraft leasing. Um, what they do is they would um, claim the depreciation on the plane in a number of different countries, the same plane. You know, the, the, the best was if you could get what's called a triple dip, you could get three countries. And so obviously they end up paying very little tax. So all of these things are possible. And the reason why they're possible is because with tax, you have this concept of tax arbitrage where you look for opportunities. Bitcoin actually has a fantastic opportunity in that regard. We ran a case against the tax office about Bitcoin, and the question was whether Bitcoin's a foreign currency. Now, that seems like an innocuous case, but it's actually a very barbed case for the tax office, and they didn't realize it. And the reason why is this. There used to be, um, people used to do these transactions with each other, banks, um, with foreign currencies, and they used to not pay much tax from, from doing those transactions. And so what the government did was they obviously wanted people to pay tax on those transactions, and they introduced these rules, these foreign exchange rules in 2003. And so all of a sudden those transactions don't work anymore. Everyone's like, oh great, I'm gonna have to come up with something else. But they didn't work anymore. So I said to the tribunal, do you know that if you don't find Bitcoin to be a foreign currency, um, all those transactions are in play again and so people can transact and not pay any tax. The tribunal member was some old dude. He didn't know what Bitcoin was. The day before the hearing, he met his nephew at a barbecue. I don't know what his nephew's qualifications were, who explained Bitcoin to him. He was influenced by that and thought Bitcoin was just a passing phase and no one really uses it. And said, well, you know, that's Parliament's problem because I don't really think people are gonna use this. I said, you're obviously not living in reality. But what you've done is you've created a legal framework now for people to legitimately do the same transactions people did in the 90s and not pay any tax. The tax office was there and they just said, well, um, you know, we also think that people don't use it or whatever. It was, it was just a bizarre situation. But in tax, that's where opportunities arise. It's when you have differences between the reality of what's happening and the law. And the tax law is rife with that situation. If you, if you don't believe me, there's a list of examples there. So I've gone through structured finance as an example. I ran through two examples just now. Um, one was the basic uh, transaction with a, with a loan which is treated differently in two jurisdictions and I went through the aircraft leasing example, and I've also just gone through the difference between the theory and the reality. But let's talk about the government response and why there's an opportunity. Now, people who, who followed Bitcoin early obviously benefited greatly because Bitcoin's gone up in value significantly. They're early adopters and everyone benefits from that. But the same happens in taxes. Did you know there used to be no capital gains tax? At that time, people used to try to work out whether a transaction was subject to tax based on how people transacted it. It had to be income. But is it income? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. People make money from transactions which have capital gains, and so the government introduces capital gains tax. But that's after many, many years and decades of people making a lot of money from it. Fringe benefits tax was the same. You pay somebody... This is from the 80s. You pay somebody in, uh, 
you know, by, you know, maybe paying their mortgage for them or buying them a car or whatever. Is that income? Maybe it's not. It's not subject to tax. That's great. The government says, hang on, a lot of people are doing this. We'll introduce fringe benefits tax. Forex, we've gone through. Um, there were a lot of these transactions, international transactions, where people were transacting foreign currencies and not paying much tax. The government said, don't like that. Eventually, introduced the Forex rules in 2003, and that was after they lost a court case. Uh, it was called ERA, where um, someone transacting in US dollars didn't have to pay the amount of tax that they thought they should be paying. The taxation of financial arrangements is another set of provisions which came in in 2008. Uh, they were there because the government wanted to tax financial institutions who were apparently doing really well. Unfortunately, the, ta the law came in just in time for the GFC, so they didn't get the revenue that they wanted, um, but they did end up allowing people to claim um, some of the losses that they were suffering at that time, so it was just in time for that. And the mining tax as well, um, if everyone remembers that, that came in just in time for the mining boom to finish. Um, and now they have BEPS, which is an attempt to um, stop some arbitrage when you have different countries involved and different countries have different rates of tax. So the point is the government is always slow and they wait until something's happened. So. What that means is there's actually a huge opportunity right now to create the entire legal framework and financial framework and tax framework for Bitcoin. The reason is because the um, tax law just takes the facts as they find it and then it tries to fit everything into those facts. And this is a problem that's been around for a long time. Um, for example, um, in some countries they have certain entity structures that don't exist here. If you've heard of a stiftung or ansalt, it doesn't, it's not like one of the Australian type of structures. And so when the Australian uh, tax law says, okay, if you've got a company, it's taxed like this. If it's a trust, it's taxed like this. If it's a person, it's like this, a partnership like this. But then you've got this weird thing called a stiftung. What's that? Doesn't know what to do, it gets confused. And that creates opportunity. A lot of people take advantage of that opportunity. But, and, and, and what it does do is then the person who does take advantage of that opportunity creates the laws. So when we go to the tribunal, for example, in the, in the case about Bitcoin, and we run a case about whether it's a foreign currency, and then bring in something about, well, do you know that all the tax planning that was done before ERA is now viable again with Bitcoin? It makes it viable again, because they don't really see that coming, because it doesn't fit within the laws. and what. The part of what the judges tend to do is they uh, tend to handball the problem onto Parliament. Now, fortunately for us, Parliament is was uh, we we didn't we obviously didn't win that case, and the um, court said that Bitcoin was not a currency. But we actually did sufficiently well at the time that the um, tribunal said, well, the reason it's not a currency is because it's not issued by a government. So it needs to be issued by a government, but also they mentioned something about being recognised by a government. Then El Salvador came along. And then the government wanted to make sure I definitely lost the case, and so they changed the law to say, well, it needs to be issued by, by a government so that, that it doesn't work. But that just helps the tax planning situation because it not being a currency opens up significant opportunities. The best way of explaining this um, is this. Everyone will have their own unique situation. Now there's, um, and, and the tax law just follows whatever your situation happens to be. And you, can, you always have choices. And I'll give a very basic example of a choice. Sometimes people will do research and development. If you do research and development, you can actually claim a tax incentive. But did you know that you can only claim it if, you're, if you use a company. If you do it in your individual capacity, you can't. So you might have someone who's done all this research and development, which would otherwise be claimable, but they did it in their own name, can't claim it. If they had chosen to do it in a company at that time, they would have got a grant. So 
a lot of the time it's about that uh, you have a lot of choices and it's about making the right choices. So when someone says to me, okay, a friend of mine has some Bitcoin, I ask them some questions. Where is that friend located? What country are they in? They usually are here. Um, <laughs> how did they, how did they, um, how did they, um, when did they buy it? How did they buy it? And so on. Because it creates a lot of choices. And within those choices, you can do something. A problem is, I want to go through specific examples of some people, but they won't like that. And then you probably will think that I'm someone who's going to go on stage and tell your story. <laughs> um, but the basics are this. If Bitcoin is treated as a capital asset, it's, it's taxed under a completely different regime to something that's not. And by treating it as a capital asset conceptually, what the government is saying is that it's no different to a microphone or this laptop or that speaker. Now, if you um, ask somebody, and think about this just logically, if you said to somebody, look, I'm going to lend you a speaker, do you pay tax on lending a speaker? If someone pays you in a speaker, what situation does that create? A lot of the rules um, that uh, relate to taxation are not based on people transacting with speakers. It's just a weird thing. People don't do that. <laughs> so, um, and the government treats Bitcoin that way too, and it's just not the reality. So when you have uh, Bitcoin as a capital asset, um, it's subject to a different taxing, completely different taxing regime, if at all. And it means that some, some types of transactions, so some types of loans, for example, are not subject to tax, but it also opens up the possibility of um, the tax being, um, if, if any, being in you know, potentially different jurisdictions. And some jurisdictions are more favourable than others. Um, and you, depending on what vehicle you use, you can also have that. So we've got a whole set of rules with tax treaties and CFCs and things like that. CFCs is when you have a, when you have a company in a different country, which potentially when it comes to Bitcoin might, may not apply. So, for example, if someone has a, has, a, um, has, a, has a company in a different country, it's not an Australian resident taxpayer. The only way the Australian government taxes that is through the CFC rules, which is okay, which um, is about passive income. This is just an example. But Bitcoin would probably not fit within those rules because it's not one of those traditional types of securities. Also, within the definition and nature of Bitcoin itself, it's never been judicial, judicially tested properly. They have a general understanding of it, but it's not, a, it's not an actual accurate understanding. If you actually understand how Bitcoin works and were to explain that properly to a judge, then some of the transactions, even including from mining, may or may not necessarily be taxable because the underlying event that gives rise to the creation of that particular asset, if it is, um, is not necessarily a taxable event because it doesn't fit within the framework of, of, the, of the existing laws because the concept of Bitcoin did not exist at the time that these laws were written. So I just wanted to impress on you that there, there is that kind of opportunity there. I've probably run out of time. Um, I would like to go through a few more examples, but I don't think I can. <laughs> so um, I might just, um, if, you have any, if you have any questions, then please just reach out. I'm happy to talk through um, with you guys. Um, thank you for your time. Oh, where can you find me? Oh, um, I just have, that's my website and my phone number, and that's my. <laughs> just for a friend. And my direct email. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I officially don't have any clients who have Bitcoin. Just um, want to say that in theory, I have no experience in this field at all. So <laughs>